Abbiamo il piacere e l'onore di ascoltare tra qualche minuto René Posnanski, Posnanski storica franco-israeliana specializzata nell'olocausto historian specialized in the Holocaust and the Jew resistance in France. She teaches at the Political Science University Ben Gurion Beersheva e ha pubblicato published over the last 20 years some very important books focused on the research about deportation and anti-Semitic tools in France. Les Juifs in France, pendant la Seconde Guerre mondiale, for example, is one of her books. More recently, Propaganda et Persecution, La Résistance et les Problèmes Juifs. And the book that will be presented today, which is uh, Grand Siencan en France, which has been written together with a French expert who is Denis Peschensky. This book has been published for by Fayard with the support of the minister, Ministry of Defense, which has been renamed as uh, Ministère des Armées, and which has a department financing and funding this kind of historical research on archives namely focused on uh, memorials. For example, the uh, Auschwitz Exposition in France has been financed by this ministry. This book, Drancien Camp en France, is in my opinion a, bibli a biography of a place. Uh, and then thinking about the writer Perec, George Perec, when he wrote the uh, book La Vie Mode d'Emploi. So the idea to build and to develop around the place through the changes of uh, and the, its changes of use and the changes that this place goes through urban modifications and the peculiarities of the place, the idea to build a biography on that. And this book is not only focused on the study of the place when it becomes uh, an internment uh, camp and then a transit camp, but also it starts from this utopia from this idea, La Cité de la Muette, an idea, a project that was designed during the 30s, which actually leads to another utopia, which is the idea to purify Europe, to have race in Europe, so basing that on the idea of La Cité de la Muette, which is the first part of the book. Then it enters in what is actually the core and the most important part for historians, uh, which is this place as a camp. So as we said this morning, the problems and the difficult aspect of defining a camp, because Drancy is more than one thing at a time, so it modifies its functions. The population itself living in this camp is modified and also the people ruling the camp change, so the uh, violence rate ex uh, changes or the expectations of this camp change. So. Drancy, but also the other transit camps become a very complex place which has not been studied in detail yet, which is more, f and the from the historical point of view, we are used to be more focused on the concentration camps than the transit camps. So I don't want to go deep into details now about these steps of the books. I just want to mention a couple of things, of remarks, because this book 
they are presented uh, the situations and the lives of some people which are first at first French and then they become German when in July 1943 the camp is managed and ruled by the French administration with the arrival of Alice Brunner who is part of this uh, a small group of experts, what uh, had been defined as the Heichfall Geifer. So this group of people that had been trained in Vienna in 1938, so when from Berlin these people were sent to solve the situation of the forced immigration of Jews, so the idea is to force Jews to leave. And Brunner is one of the supporter and the assistant of Heifman, and he becomes an expert of deportation, so in terms of logistics of uh, flows of people who are deported, and he has his own curriculum from this point of view, which is terrific, because Brunner actually takes care of the Austrian deportation, he manages also the deportation of uh, German Jews, then he works uh, with Titer Wieslicher for the deportation in Greece and then he joins the French uh, management. These people are, averagely speaking, 30 years old and they rule these transit camps. And this is a very important date, in my opinion. This generation of people is a generation of people with 30 years old. These are the people defined as the Uverdingten generation which is the absolute generation. So just a few people, we are talking about SS, SD, men, so these organizations at the top of this uh, destruction structure, which are very well motivated, they are quite smart actually, and they, in a very short period, they are able to achieve this absolute deportation goal. So this is not just the stereotype of uh, the uh, Evil, as Anna Arendt uh, talks. And finally, through Drancy, which is just a small village outside Paris where, where this camp is based, so it's, it becomes a um, transit camp for a few years, and through Drancy pass the majority of the transports towards Auschwitz or towards other concentration camps, and this means that the majority of the French Jews deported, so talking about thousands of people, passed through Drancy. So this is, this is why this place is a key place for the deportation of the Western, for the Western deportation of Jews in Europe. And just a very last data, in France, like in Hungary, like in Bulgaria, like in Romania, the majority of Jews which are killed are foreign Jews, so foreigners like people living in France or in Hungary, they are the first ones being killed by Germans and the German need to kill people, this, to kill these people. So now I will leave the floor to René Poznanski. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this nice presentation and ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'm thrilled to be here and I'm very grateful to the organizers who invited me. Um, well, I, unfortunately I don't know your beautiful language so you'll have to listen to my French English. I'll do my best. Uh, what you see here is a road sign indicating that you are entering the city of Drancy. It's located some 10 kilometers from Paris in the immediate, immediate neighborhood of the capital of France, the city of Lights. You can easily get there with the RER and you pass through it on your way to Charles de Gaulle. You see here. Uh, to Charles de Gaulle Airport. The name of the station is very simple. It's 
Drancy. During World War II, the infamous camp of the Jews was located there, some 500 meters alone away from the local market. More than 100,000 Jew Jewish internees have been interned in this camp for, di from, for different period of times, sometimes 24 hours and sometimes during month. And 67,000, which is 84% of all the Jews deported from France, were among them. Its site is obviously first and foremost remembered as such, and Drancy became the th symbol of the tragic fate of the Jews deported from France and exterminated in Auschwitz. Yet, as is, has been already mentioned, the story of the camp of Drancy doesn't begin with the camp, as it was used to be called during the war, the Camp des Juifs. And this story is remarkable from its very beginning. Since ages, and I'm beginning with the pre-war years, since ages, the site itself is called the Cité de la Muette, located in the municipality of a little city called Drancy. In the 30s, its character remained essentially rural, although the development of the railway network had led to the development of the city itself after World War I. And this is the place where the building of a new kind of social housing was to be erected improving considerably the life of those who could not afford a house. The architectural project was very ambitious and had many avant-garde components for the sake of the social purpose. It became famous on the national scene. Postcards have been printed and sold out. You see here an example of a postcard, which is uh, which is called the, sky the first skyscrapers in the Parisian region. But it was famous on the international area as well. Books and articles have been published in architectural journals in the US and it praised, they praised its pioneering perspective. These were, as I said, the first skyscrapers in the Paris area. And actually, these high buildings were the first buildings to be finished and the only one to be inhabited before the war. Although I must say, from the beginning, it was not real a success. And they couldn't find many tenants. And for that reason, the buildings uh, have been handed to the Ministry of Defense and, and uh, has been inhabited but people working there. The building materials, as well as the industrial methods, were completely new. For instance, most of the work was produced on the spot in order to lower the coast. Here you have a panoramic view of how it was supposed to look like. And those pioneering re uh, methods were meant to allow high quality housing for the underprivileged. You see there were uh, plans of how they should, the, 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 the housewives should be uh, to work in comfortable settings and everything was prepared in such a way. But this magnificent project began in the early 30s and the economic crisis put an end on it while the construction was on. Here you can see what has been accomplished, the black parts, all the, uh, all the parts uh, which are in black. But all of it, except for the skyscrapers, uh, were remained as a kind of work site with unfinished buildings, frameworks next to the inhabited skyscrapers. Well, this was the pre-war history of this site, and that is the way we uh, encounter the premises until the war broke out. As you know, France was defeated after five weeks of fighting. More than half of France, including Paris, was occupied after the armistice, and the Germans were looking for a place 
to intern the French prisoners of war. There was a war going on, prisoners of war. So they had to be interned in some place before being sent to Germany. So those unfinished empty buildings could do the job. During this first stage, Drancy became therefore a German camp for French prisoners of war, the Franche Talag 111. Here you have the list of which have been published in the French newspapers. It includes those French POW interned during about three months in Drancy, soon to be followed by British and Canadian civilians arrested by the Germans as citizens of allied countries. So it has been a camp for Germans and then a camp for British and Canadian civilians. So before we even get to the very heart of this tragic story, the Cité de la Muette has gone through different stages. A pioneering social and architectural project, a German camp for French prisoners of war, and a, and a, and a German camp for something like 980 prisoners of aligned countries residing in defeated France. In the beginning of August 41, the camp was emptied and all the facilities that had been placed there, especially during the third period, in order to humanize the lot of the administrative internees, have been removed. Bare concrete walls of unfinished buildings with nothing left in them that was we have now. From then on, the story of the camp becomes intertwined with the persecution of the Jews of France, all of France, the northern occupied zone, as well as the southern, presumably free zone, under the authority of the Vichy government headed by Maréchal Pétain. After the fall, fall of France and the subsequent armistice, the Jews of the occupied zone found themselves very soon victimized by a dual anti-Semitic legislation, German and French. On, the sept on September 27 of 1940, the German ordered a census of all Jews and they required the French police to stamp the Jews' identity cards so that they could be identified at, this, at each checkpoint. For its part, the Vichy government inaugurated this anti-Semitic policy with a series of measures that denaturalized foreigners who had acquired French nationality during the preceding decades and limited access to certain professions to native-born French citizens. Next, a Jewish statute issued on the beginning of October 1940 transformed the Jews into second-class citizens overnight, banishing them from the civil service, the officer ranks, and fields that influence public opinion, such as communications, movies, and journalism. At the same time, the regime also issued an edict which authorized prefects to intern foreign Jews in special camps by administrative order. This edict made it possible to send 40,000 foreign Jews to camps in the southern zone. One of them, you heard about it, is Les Milles. And it served as a legal basis for the roundups there, as well as in Paris, where it led to the internment of some 8,000 Jews in 1941 alone. We are not yet speaking at all about the final solution. When making these arrests, the French police used lists drawn up from the registry of Jews created by police headquarters on the basis of the Jewish census of September 1940. Anxious to retain or recover its sovereignty, which was really its main obsession in, in as many, many areas as possible, the Vichy government placed its bureaucracy at the service of the German occupier in the northern zone to enforce the subsequent anti-Jewish leg legislation that confined Jews to a social and cultural ghetto. It also seized Jewish property, the step-by-step -step plunder of, uh, of which had been commanded by German occupation authorities in order to Aryanize the economy. On March 1941, the Germans ordered Vichy to create a new department, 
the Commissariat General aux Questions Juives. Xavier Valla, which is whom you see here, the first commissioner for Jewish affairs, completed the anti-Semitic legislation with a new Jewish statute, issued in June 1941. This statute modified the definition of who should be considered as a Jew, enlarging, widening the definition, purged Jews from the liberal professions, extended the list of occupations from which they were excluded, and instituted a numerous clauses of 3% in the universities. It also mandated a Jewish census in the southern zone and the Aryanization of Jewish property in the free zone, the so-called free zone. We are not talking here about a random collection of occasional texts, but of several dozens of laws, decrees, bulletins, and ordinances. I recall the arrest of foreign Jews in, France, in Paris. There were two waves of massive arrests before the summer of 1942. In May, uh, May of 1941 and in August of 1941, the latter, in August of 1941, and I'll come back to it, led to the transformation of the Cité de la Muette into the camp of the Jews. Ostracism and looting were merely preliminary stages. From the spring of 42 on, the application of the final solution to the Jews of France became the order of the day. On March 27, 1942, a first convoy transported more than 1,000 Jews from France to an unknown de destination in the east. They left from Drancy, some of, most of them. But it was the appearance of the yellow star at the, in the streets of Paris and throughout the occupied zone that clearly indicated the dimensions of the change. The eighth ordinance of the German military command in France signed in May 2942 and published on June the 1st of 1942 required Jews over the age of six to permanently affix to their clothes a six-pointed yellow star with black borders that had to be the size of a pole. Once this concrete distinction had been implemented, it became possible to further isolate the Jews in the capital. They were relegated to the last car on the metro. They were then allowed into stores for only one hour a day. Finally, Jews were barred from theaters and other institutions open to the public. But even those measures, but you see how the segregation went gradually until it became a segregation into the, uh, behind the barbed wires. But even those measures were only a prelude. Having got the full collaboration of the French government, including the French police, for the implementation in France of the final solution, the German authorities could proceed in the best conditions. Here is the French government leaving the crucial cabinet meeting during which the government decided to allow the French police to organize mass arrests of Jews to be deported. This picture has only recently been discovered. I mean, this is completely, I mean, the first publication was in the book uh, which was referred to. And indeed, Arrest followed by deportation to an unknown destination, that's how it was called, became then the most terrifying threat to the Jewish population, first in the occupied zone and then throughout the entire country. Three convoys set out for Auschwitz from the camps in the occupied zone on June 22, 25, 28 of 1942. Now these camps, and it included Drancy, and I'll come back for to Drancy, of course, now emptied of their inmates could subsequently absorb new victims. On July 16 and 17, 1942, and the following days, more than 13,000 stateless Jews, including almost 6,000 women and more than 4,000 children. So out of the 13,000, you have 6,000 women 
and 4,000 children were arrested in Paris by the French police as part of this vast operation that came to be known as the Veldiv Roundup. The families were first sent to the Vélodrome d'Hiver, whence the name of the Roundup, and then to the infamous camp of Drancy, before their final journey to Auschwitz in sealed freight cars. This fate befell all of those arrested, including the children, who had witnessed their parents' deportation while waiting for the Germans to subscribe to the French proposal to deport the children as well. In early August, I mean, all this background is necessary to understand what was going on in the camp itself. In early August, the Jews of the southern zone suddenly faced the same threat. The internment camps and camps for foreign workers were provided uh, there, provided new cargo for the sealed freight cars that rumbled toward the extermination camps. Then, everywhere, in what was still called the free zone, French police arrested foreign Jews using census lists already drawn up. At the end of August 1942, a memo by National Police Headquarters reported that more than 11,000 Jews had been apprehended since the start of the month, in one month, and deported to the occupied zone, which meant to Drancy. Between March and September of 1942, more than 38 thousand Jews were deported from France in 41 convoys, all of them from Drancy to Auschwitz. The mass arrests of Jews conducted by the French police continued in waves throughout both zones until February of 1944. There were also the constant arrest of individuals, an activity in which the German police, aided by auxiliary police forces, no, auxiliary forces, not, I mean, not the legal police, it was legal, but not the official police, drawn from French collaborationist groups, were increasingly involved. After November 42, when the Germans took over the southern zone following the Allied landing in North Africa, the occupation authorities operated throughout French territory. The arrests of Jews, therefore, continued until the entire country had been liberated. Moreover, the circle of potential victims kept expanding. Jews of foreign nationalities, French Jews, those in possession of a German-issued Ausweis, which had granted them a measure of protection until then. A activists of a Jewish organization which were still legal, hospital patients, residents of senior citizen homes, and finally, children. No Jew was safe. The last roundup of children from Jewish homes in the Paris region took place between July 21 and 25, 1944, and led to the deportation of 258 children. The peak month of the for the deportations were February through March 44. In only an eight-month period in 1944, a total of close to 15,000 Jews were sent to the death camp in Poland. All told, almost 76,000 Jews were deported from France, of whom only 3% survived. Drancy was central to this development of the anti-Jewish policy, and the history of the camp Camp des Juifs, which opened as such in the wave of the massive arrest of August 1941, followed the different stages of persecution from ostracism to deportation, while the internment conditions changed accordingly. Beginning at at 5.30 in the morning of August 20, 1941, the 11th arrondissement of Paris was completely surrounded. The French police had been ordered to arrest all male Israelites between the age of 18 and 50, except for those who were American citizens. 
The police also came prepared to conduct searches of private residents, armed with leads pushed together by referring to the court file of the prefecture de police. In cases where the Jews, in cases where the Jews being hunted were absent, they took another member of the family. Police agents went from house to house, from street to street. Metro station had been closed in the entire arrondissement. Police barricades had been set up at all the streets leading out of the arrondissement and were, as a general rule, backed up by the German army. On the first day of the operation, some 3,000 Jews were brutally torn away from their homes. They were first led to local police station, then taken by bus to Drancy. Arrest continued on on the following two days in other sections of Paris. Some Jews were apprehended at their homes, others in a cafe, in a restaurant, and in all sorts of other public places. Often, often the victims had nothing but the clothes on their back, summer clothes, or work clothes in most cases, when they were arrested. A total of 4,232 Jews were rounded up over three days. Well, you can see what it meant for the Jews. They were apprehended in the street, and suddenly they were, around, they were behind barbed wires, behind the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the watchtowers, the miradors. The camp meant the Jews became prisoners, held behind barbed wires, constantly under civilians. Joseph Lubitsch, Joseph Lubitsch, a painter of the Ecole de Paris, born in Bielorussia, was one of the painters who was interned. He succeeded in escaping from the last transport that departed from Drancy on August 17, 1944. Now you can see the camp itself. Jewish prisoners in the camp. We are no longer in a German stalag. It was a French camp, entirely run by a French staff. You can see French gendarmes here. Uh, the French administration was responsible for the food provided and all the services. And the French gendarmes were in charge of the civilians of the, uh, of the inmates, who at the time were only men. I mentioned the Mirador, and here you have them, you saw a, a drawing, now you see a picture of those Mirador. But what you see here too is here, you have the camp of Drancy, the city of La Muette. You see that it's inside the city. It's completely into the city. As I mentioned before, 500 meters of the local market. And you can see here the Mirador, but you can see the little houses, which are just behind the barbed wires. So the camp, the, those people saw what was happening in the camp. They saw everything. The camp was not isolated. Another painter, and I'll get back to him, is Georges Oran. He illustrates the anger in the camp because there was anger. Nothing had been prepared to, uh, for those prisoners who were found suddenly themse themselves there. Uh, they had to, nothing had been prepared, and more than 4,000 people suddenly. They had to look into the trash to find something to eat. Maybe the clearest expression of the horrible conditions that the Jews suddenly encountered in Drancy. And they couldn't correspond with their family, at least in the beginning. So one of the buildings had balconies. And those balconies was face, were facing this little house on the other side. So what did the internees do? They were writing clandestine letters, attached them with a stone, and a, put some money with it, and throw these into the go little gardens 
hoping that the people living there would be kind enough to take the money and send the letters to their family in Paris. I mean, this was one of the means to correspond while they didn't have any right to correspond with anybody. And even when they got the right to correspond, these letters were going through censorship by the administrators of the camp. So the clandestine networks went on working and clandestine letters were being sent all over the whole period of the war. The other thing which uh, the uh, internees did in order to uh, maybe see, but it's really from far away, their family, from these balconies, they were standing there, although it was completely forbidden, standing there, and there was a hotel just on the other side of the street in Drancy itself, and it's actually still a restaurant, you'll see it in the last picture, and they were the, the, the wives of those internees were going in one of the rooms, and from there, they could try and correspond by signs. While in the clandestine letters, they were explaining this is means something, and this means something, and etc., etc. So this was really a way of trying to get some contact with the outside world. This is one example of the clandestine uh, letter of Abraham Baron to his wife, Marise. And it's extremely interesting to read all those letters. And there are, so, there are plenty of those letters. I mean, if somebody wants to do a PhD on those letters, there is still a possibility to do that. I mean, in the Memorial de la Shoah, plenty of them haven't been actually uh, read. They, they are there, and, and it's, it's, it's really a big quantity of uh, letters. But uh, it's not only letters. Um, this is for me the occasion to recall the wonderful personal documents that have been produced in the camps. We saw uh, some of the drawings. We saw here a letters, and uh, there are diaries. One of the most impressive diaries have been written by a painter who was interned between July 42 and April 1943. Uh, then he was released. It's Georges Oran, whom I mentioned before. Actually, he had a common project with René Blum, Léon Blum's brother. They intended to document the life as an inmate of an inmate, inmate in Drancy. Georges Oran would draw and René Blum would write. But René Blum was deported in September of 1942 and never returned from Auschwitz. Therefore, Georges Oran took upon himself the writing as well. Conditions got a little better after the first weeks of improvisation and after tens of prisoners died of malnutrition. We are still in the first stage of this history, a time when only men were interned. But with the implementation of the final solution on French territory, things changed radically. First women in the first stage, and children a few weeks later, later joined the male prisoners. You can imagine what happened then. The women, which were the first victims of the notorious Raffle du Veldiv in mid-July 1942. They were much more numerous to be arrested during this roundup. There were two reasons for that. Many of the husbands had already been arrested. That's the first reason. And the second reason, there had been rumors of a new mass arrest, but nobody thought that this time women and children would be arrested. In many families, the husbands went into hiding and the policers found only their wife and children, so they arrested them. Children of all ages, as documented by Georges Oran, arriving without their parents who had been already deported. The families had been, first of all, put in another camp, and from then, the fathers have been deported, 
Then the mothers have been, depo have been deported, and the children were waiting for the authorization from Eichmann to be deported as well. So they were from there trans transferred to Drancy and, depo and, and arrived there. And I mean, the, the description we have, I don't have it here, but the description we have of the arrival of children by Georges Oran and by others is absolutely incredible. I mean, those children coming after days without their parents, some of them not knowing who they are anymore, in a terrible condition, physical condition. And they were put into those wagons together with adults and, and sent to their deaths. None of them returned, by the way. The second huge transformation is the internment camp became a transit camp. The camp to which all Jews arrested in France were first sent because the, before the long trip to the east. You can see the arrows coming from the south and moving to Drancy and then to the east. Um, meanwhile, in the camp of Drancy, uh, Jews who had been put on the list of the next convoy to the east waited behind the barbed wires to be loaded to the buses in the direction of the railway station. Look at the children, some of them with their supposed name written on their chest. Uh, it was really supposed names because the, it's the people in Drancy who tried to uh, just uh, put their names, but the children didn't always remember. Some of the internees remained only one night or a fortnight in the camp, waiting in separate staircases for the train to load them. So they knew they would be deported. They were in separate staircase waiting there. I mean, it was uh, absolutely, and the others, so remaining in the other staircases, we are looking at them, hoping that there would be no defection, because if there are defections, somebody dies, somebody else would be taken from the other staircases. Uh, and some of them waited several days or several weeks, and then there, was th there were those who tried every possible mean not to be included in the list for the next convoy. The atmosphere in the camp became absolutely unbearable. But it became even worse when the German police decided to take over. In the beginning of July 43, Drancy became a German camp. And this is Alois Brunner, you heard about before, the infamous Alois Brunner, Brunner who had proved successful in the deportation of the Jews of Vienna and of, uh, uh, of Greece and who had proved, uh, he arrived in France and became responsible for the camp and the deportation of as many Jews as possible from France. The French police was then replaced by German police in the camp. Violence toward the internees became the rule. Everything you heard about Malin now can be said about what happened in Drancy. The prisoners became responsible for the, the prisoners themselves, the Jews themselves, became responsible for the implementation of German orders in the camp. The only Jewish organization organ allowed in France was to take care of all the expense need for the maintenance of Drancy, including improving the, 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 the place with a garden in the middle and all kind of aesthetic transformation while terror was really reigning in the camp. Um, conditions then were uh, worse than ever and these splendid paintings by Jeanne Lévy give you a sense of the misery in each of the barrack rooms. An interesting question concerns the inhabitants of this little city, and more generally, the reaction of the French population to what was happening in close neighborhood to the capital. 
Unfortunately, and this is really, really unfortunate, Drancy inhabitants have not been interviewed when this was still possible. And the archives of the municipality during the war have been destroyed. One of the rare testimonies we have recalls the discomfort brought about by the spotlight uh, which was revolving during the night. Indifference? Maybe. And the only newspapers, maybe indifference again, which denounced the conditions in the camp were those underground publications issued by the Jewish communist organizations. The other clandestine newspapers didn't mention it. The last Jewish prisoners to be incarcerated in Drancy entered the camp on August 11, 1944. Six days later, Brunner left Drancy, which was officially liberated the next day. 1,386 Jews were still in the camp, and last of them left on August 20. But the camp went on. Less, I'm, I'm finishing less than 10 minutes. But the camp went on. Less than two weeks after the departures of the last Jewish prisoner, more than 4,000 French collaborators, or supposed collaborators, were arrested and transferred to Drancy, waiting for their trial. 2,000 more joined them the next month, and altogether, more than 11,400 collaborators spent some weeks or months in the camp, waiting for judgment. On September the 8th, 1945, the premises were empty. From then on, the Cité de la Muette could return to its original purpose, to provide social housing. The completion of the building was immediately resumed a few weeks later, and at the beginning of 1949, all the new apartments were inhabited. Yet, its history could not be erased. Some memorial plaque plates made their entry into the U of the camp. Commemorations began to take place there every year. At, well, at, in fact, there were commemora Jewish commemorations before 49, and then they were transferred to the main synagogue in Paris because they were already inhabitants and they couldn't hold the commemoration there. But they were resumed in the mid-90s. Following the development of Shoah's memory in the Western world, monuments were added to the site. A monumental sculpture by Shlomo Zellinger was inaugurated in 1976, here you have it, and a wagon added in 1988. The last stage was the opening of in, in 2012 of, memoria, of a memorial museum facing the camp. Just imagine this incredible sight now, a site where past and present are intimately threaded together, a place where people live, an ordinary place with an extraordinary history. And what the, I, was, I asked the question about those luxury apartments in Malin, because here you have a totally different story. You have poor people, immigrants, some of them, or coming from immig uh, immigrant families. And facing them, and inside the U, you see the U of the camp here. This is the camp. And you see the museum here facing the camp. This was the restaurant I was referred to before, which was a hotel. From those windows, the wives of the prisoners tried to talk, if we can call this talk, with their husbands in the camp. And here, I mean, these are only windows where people coming to visit the museum can have a look at the site of the camp. And this coexistence is extremely interesting, 
but the, the conceptors of the museum really tried to initiate immediately a dialogue and, uh, with, the, with the inhabitants of, the, uh, of there, and their uh, apartments have been restored in order for them not to have a look at this luxurious building with, I mean, a strange uh, eyes and, and are wondering how is it that such a nice building is here and they have poor, miserable buildings there. So they, they had actually, they profited from what happened on the site. So I think that from now on, it's really an extraordinary uh, site altogether. Now, so this is the book on which which we wrote together with Denis Pechansky. And it, it tries to, really what, what you said before, to present all the, the facets of this extraordinary uh, site. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, René, for your very interesting speech about the history of this camp. I really believe we've been really amazed by how complex it is, the history changing in this place, and also we already have here some kind of uh, division between camps, so the first feature is maybe hidden camps compared with visible camps. This is uh, incredibly visible, and as we saw from the pictures, and this involves also the aspect of people that from outside can see what happens inside, so in comparison with what may happen in isolated camps. And I think that we just recently started talking about uh, how isolated camps actually had a population living all around them, these uh, camps. And there is all a research developed, by, uh, developed on one, what happened in Treblinka in Poland, where apparently an entire community uh, grew all around the camp, so this even changes what is the model that we think and we are used to think about, we, we have been talking about indifference and about those dark uh, places and how these places actually uh, become uh, more and more visible. So the transit camp is extremely visible, it was the core, the center of the transit camp, so it was at the core of the German uh, policy, maybe the most visible one uh, in the and very present in the urban uh, area. So that's very important to be considered. <laughs> 